Hello, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Dr. Erica Hamilton. I lead the Breast Cancer Research Program here at Sarah Cannon Research Institute in Nashville, Tennessee. Today, we're gonna to be discussing how to harness adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibition to prevent recurrences in high-risk hormone receptor positive early breast cancer. And I'm joined today by my colleague, uh, Professor Stephen Johnson. Stephen? Thank you very much, uh, Erica. So I'm Stephen Johnson. I'm a medical oncologist and head of the breast unit at the Royal Marsden Hospital in London. So we're going to look at the various gaps and opportunities for improving outcome in hormone positive HER2 negative breast cancer. We know that about 30% of patients with this subtype of breast cancer are at risk of recurrence, and that risk depends on the clinical and pathological features. So for these patients, we still do need better treatment options to try and prevent recurrence. And we've made really important progress recently with the FDA approval based on the Monarch E trial of adjuvant abemacyclib. And this is a practice changing development. So we're going to focus a little bit on the data and then some real life cases, because there is a need for a broader discussion of the clinical features of patients that would benefit from this treatment uh, and really identify who really requires this therapy. Now, if we think about progress in the last 20 years in hormone positive HER2 negative breast cancer, we've not really had any new therapies since the aromatase inhibitors uh, nearly 20 years ago. We know from the overview analysis that they're a little bit better than tamoxifen in postmenopausal women, as you can see on the right. But we do have this problem of early recurrences despite either of these hormone-based therapies. And really understanding who these patients are is the big unmet need in hormone positive HER2 negative breast cancer. So we're going to have a little look at the data now and I'll pass back to uh, Erica to really take us through uh, the Monarch E trial. Thanks so much, Stephen. So this is the Monarch E study design and I think you're all familiar with it at this point. It's for hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative patients that have high risk disease. It did include men, which I think is important um, to say here. And in cohort one, we had high risk based on clinical pathological features. And so this was automatic entry criteria if the patient had four or more positive nodes. And if there were one to three positive nodes, they had to meet an additional high risk criteria, either have grade three disease or a tumor size of at least five centimeters. And if you look on the bottom, cohort two was high risk based on key 67. Again, those patients were one to three positive nodes and then had a key 67 of at least 20% um, and didn't meet those other criteria. Patients were randomized to either endocrine therapy, standard of care, or endocrine therapy in conjunction with a bimacyclib, 150 milligrams twice daily for a two year treatment period. And then obviously additional follow-up after afterwards. I wanna highlight that this really was a quite large trial. Patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion, uh, over 5,500 uh, patients and stratified by prior chemo, their menopausal status, and the region of enrollment. So here are the baseline characteristics. I think um, this is self-explanatory, but essentially average age in the 50s, um, the majority of patients were postmenopausal at about 55 to 60%. Uh, about a third of patients had neoadjuvant chemotherapy and about 60% had had adjuvant therapy. So moral of the story, very few patients had not received chemotherapy, which is consistent with this being a high risk population. Tumor size, uh, really about 20%, uh, five centimeters, about half of patients, two to five centimeters and a quarter less than two centimeters and node-wise, it broke down about 60% of patients having at least four positive nodes, 40% being in that one to three category. And again, how did we uh, see the key 67? Uh, key 67 was about 45% greater than 20%, 35% less than 20%, and then the rest were unavailable, remember, because there were ways to qualify without key 67 at all based on those uh, four, um, nodes being uh, involved.
So what did we see in the trial? Obviously, you can see the red uh, graphic here, which was endocrine therapy plus abemocyclib hazard ratio of 0.696 in favor of adding abemocyclib. And this translated to an over 30% reduction in the risk of an invasive disease-free event. The absolute difference at three years was 5.4%. And again, this is the intention to treat population. So what if we look across subgroups, and I know this slide um, is small uh, for you, um, really you know, kind of consistent benefit across the board. Uh, we see that very large confidence interval at the grade one, uh, really because there were very few patients, only 200 um, that had a grade one. Uh, if you follow a little bit farther down uh, in tumor stage, there's a little blip it looks like at stage 2B, but again, really this was a small uh, number of patients here and it really appeared um, you know, in other scenarios that patients got benefit across the board there. So here's distant recurrence-free survival, again in the intention to treat population. Hazard ratio is 0.67, a 31.3% reduction in the risk of a distance recurrence-free survival event. And the absolute benefit here is 4.2% at three years. So what this means for us is that yes, the benefit was across the board, but it was also predominantly, we were preventing distant events. This wasn't a local recurrence or something that was potentially curative. And so what did we see over time? So in this table, you can see uh, within the first year, years one to two or years two plus, and our hazard ratio actually um, was improving. So we were down to a 0 0.5 uh, here for year two plus, and same with distance recurrence-free survival. So these were not immediate events. The magnitude of benefit was still increasing over time. And so based on this, uh, the FDA did approve adjuvant and bimacyclib for high-risk hormone receptor positive uh, patients. This was October of 2021. But there was one interesting caveat to this, and I'm gonna let Stephen talk a little bit more about it. But essentially the approval was patients at high risk and a key I-67 score of at least 20% with a companion diagnostic from DACO. Stephen, I'll let you go into this a little bit more. Thank you very much, uh, Erica. So the other data at this current stage was the survival data. And these, the trial is really still very immature for overall survival. Um, these data were published as a letter in the Lancet Oncology, in Annals of Oncology after the full latest data were published. And overall, you can see here, there's absolutely no difference in overall survival. But in those patients who had a high key 67 in addition to the high clinical risk features, then there was a hazard ratio here of 0.767. Um, it's still not statistically significant, but in the FDA indicated population, there does appear to be a trend in these higher risk patients to a survival moving in that direction in favor of a bemocyclib. But the full analysis of overall survival is immature and will await a further planned protocol defined analysis. So let's look a little bit more at key 67 as a factor in decision making in hormone positive HER2 negative breast cancer. If we look at the uh, key 67 high population in the intent to treat population, you can see here, just like the overall study, a positive benefit for the addition of a bemocyclib. Here a 33.7% reduction in risk of developing an event, which means at the three year point, the absolute difference was 6%. Now, I think the best way of looking at key 67 is in this particular graph published in the Annals of Oncology paper, where we identify the prognostic role of key 67, but not necessarily the predictive benefit for the addition of a bemocyclib. Look first in the blue curves here, which is the impact in just the control arm of high key 67 versus low key 67. And you can see in the solid line, which was the high key 67, how much worse those patients are doing in terms of the regular relapse rate compared to the low key 67 group. This is some of the best prospective data with endocrine therapy alone about the role of key 67. If you look at the addition of a bemocyclib in the red curves for solid, for high key 67, 
and in the dotted for Loki 67, you see an absolute benefit, but the quantum of benefit is greater in the patients who have the high key 67. And I think this is one of the factors in the FDA decision making that this is the group that have perhaps the most to benefit at this particular stage. The events in the low key 67 are, early, are, are lower at this rate because they've got better prognosis, but there still does appear to be some benefit in that group. Now, in terms of understanding this, has caused quite a lot of interest because there are some patients who would have high clinical risk features, but not necessarily a high key 67. And what you can see here in this graph here is that if you look, for example, at the auxiliary node status, you can see at those patients with four or more nodes, over half of the patients, 55%, actually had a key 67 less than 20%. So on the current criteria would not derive um, approval for uh, adjuvant abemocyclib in the US indication, although they clearly are at risk. And in the intent to treat population, the patients with four or more nodes clearly derive benefit regardless of key 67. So it's caused a lot of controversy about those with high clinical risk features who may still be candidates for therapy, regardless of what the level of the key 67 is. The other problem with key 67 is its reproducibility and its analytical validity. And it's been clear from a lot of recent publications, and this refers to the JNCI paper from last year, that those with very low levels, less than three or five percent, uh, less than five percent, or those with very high levels, more than 30 percent, that's very clear that those predict for good prognosis and poor prognosis. It's not a chemotherapy predicting identifier, but it is an indicator of risk of recurrence. The middle ground around about the 20% mark is clearly where there's a lot more ambiguity about what the absolute value means. So the ASCO guidelines have reflected this in terms of their interpretation of the data and added, as you can see in the middle here, a panel that's somewhat broader than the FDA label based on the clinical risk features as identified within the trial, where regardless of key 67, there appears to be benefit in the high risk clinical features. And we'll come back to aspects of that in discussion of the cases. Now, it's important for you to know that there are downloadable um, practice, practice aids that you can do here in terms of consideration of the patients that are suitable for adjuvant abemocyclib. You can refer to these materials in your own practice to help you navigate the indications and the guidance recommendations, determine the patients that are most suitable for the addition of adjuvant abemocyclib, and also look at how you manage adverse events. And we'll come back to that a little bit later on. I'm going to pass back to Erica now to talk about one of her patients that actually went into the trial just to give you a little bit more granularity about how patients were selected for and managed in the trial. Erica. Yeah, absolutely. This is a patient that I still see and is near and dear uh, to my heart. She's actually um, a gastroenterologist that practices here uh, locally. Um, the history dates back to 2017 where she had a routine screening mammogram that noticed a 1.4 centimeter bass. Ultimately, this was biopsied. Um, at that point, looked to be invasive lobular carcinoma, uh, grade two, and they also biopsied a suspicious lymph node that was involved with cancer. ER was 90% positive, PR 25%, and HER2 was non-amplified by FISH. She subsequently had a breast MRI, which suggested maybe a lesion in the right side of the breast and showed the known 1.5 centimeter mass in the left side of the breast with an enlarged axillary lymph node that was 1.8 centimeters. We did rule out pathology on the right side. She had a biopsy and it was just a fibroadenoma and her genetic testing interestingly came back with a BARD1 mutation. She had systemic staging that appeared to be a negative and ultimately went on to have lumpectomy with a 1.8 centimeter invasive ductal carcinoma and four out of 26 involved lymph nodes. The largest was 1.2 centimeters with focal nodal extension. She had systemic uh, staging again at that point. It had been a little bit of time. She was PET negative. Uh, we opted for four cycles of TC chemotherapy. And interestingly, she uh, really started to struggle with neuropathy, which I think is a little bit less frequent with four cycles of TC, um, but we did have to dose reduce her taxane at cycle four due to grade two neuropathy. She was very resistant to this. I think uh, being a physician kind of knew her recurrence risk, et cetera, but we were able to convince her uh, to reduce 
she had adjuvant and breast radiation and then interestingly she began working um, only part-time uh, due really to her neuropathy she felt less confident operating uh, the controls um, particularly doing endoscopies uh, with her neuropathy um, and so she kind of uh, gave up doing endoscopies and went to more of a medical um, gastroenterology practice in May of 2018, she enrolled on Monarch E with letrozole uh, plus or minus abemacyclib. And her biggest side effect really was some fatigue that was pretty easy to manage, but she did have grade one and sometimes at grade two diarrhea. Uh, we tried multiple uh, anti-diarrheals and she actually preferred to have the diarrhea than taking the anti-diarrheals, which is something I hear from some patients, although a little bit more rare. She really thought that the anti-diarrheals caused more abdominal discomfort and cramping type feeling, and so um, she tended to not use those very much. Uh, potentially uh, interesting side note and very unfortunate for this patient's family um, with their BARD1 mutation. About this time, her sister was diagnosed with glioblastoma and subsequently uh, died out of the country. And so she was traveling back and forth a little bit with her sister being ill. Um, things like that obviously have impact on diarrhea as well, being on in airplanes, et cetera. Um, so I bring this up just kind of as a real world patient experience. She did um, complete all of her abemacyclib. She did not uh, dose reduce nor wanted a dose reduction. And then she did end up switching from letrozole over to tamoxifen once she was done with her two years uh, due to arthralgias. And today she still remains disease free. She's continuing to work part time. Um, and she does take some uh, gabapentin at night for her neuropathy, um, but otherwise does quite well. So I think this case just brings up, you know, several issues around the treatment for our patients. Certainly neuropathy and kind of coming into a bemacyclib, maybe a little bit more beat up. It's obviously something else that you have to sign up for for several years and can have impacts on tolerability. But luckily, this patient um, was able uh, to continue. Uh, Erica, did you did you consider at any stage um, a dose adjustment at all? Because obviously. Um, you know, patients will feel they have to, you know, suffer the take the pain, you know, the toxicities to get the benefit. Um, but in yeah. advanced disease, we know that the dose reductions still have the same PFS benefit. We're waiting to see in Monarch E, but 40 odd percent of patients in the trial were dose reduced. Did you contemplate that? Yeah, we talked to her about that at multiple points. She did not want to dose reduce. She really felt that although she had some diarrhea, that it was manageable, that she was still, you know, able to go to work, et cetera, and was not interested in any dose reductions. Some, sometimes this, uh, us physicians can be uh, the toughest patients, right? Yeah, exactly. But also driving that is presumably her own fear about her perceived level of risk because of the four nodes. Was that a sort of driver in her mind that she had to do anything and everything because of that level of risk. Yeah, yeah, potentially so. Um, you know, I, I think that's a good point. Yeah. Okay, I mean, um, I think that raises quite a lot of interesting points. We'll come back to the, uh, in one of our, our further cases about the management of, of diarrhea, but it also illustrates, I think, the commitment that the patients in the trial had. Uh, we had five and a half thousand patients in the trial um, in 600 hospitals around just under 40 countries. So um, it was a big commitment of these patients to stay on study drug and stay on trial to produce this, this data. So thank you for your patient and, and the others who went on. Yeah, she was actually my first call when we uh, saw the press release and had approval. So I, I think she was very proud to be part of it. That's great. So let's move on and look at some other cases now. And we're going to uh, look at a, um, a more borderline case. Um, and this is a patient of mine. Uh, that I saw uh, this last month. So she's a 39-year-old premenopausal woman with one uh, four-year-old child. Um, she had a screen-detected cancer. Uh, she had a positive family history. Her mother had breast cancer in her 50s. Um, it was a one-centimeter lesion, grade two on biopsy, strongly hormone positive for estrogen and progesterone receptor, negative for HER2 with a normal axilla. She had breast-conserving surgery and a central node biopsy. Uh, and this revealed a 1.1 centimeter grade two invasive ductal cancer, completely excised with clear margins, no lymphovascular invasion, one out of four sentinel nodes that was a macrometastasis. And again, pathology confirmed strongly uh, hormone positive, HER2 negative, and a key 67 came back at 25%. 
Now, um, an oncotype was requested for this particular patient. Uh, BRCA gene testing was undertaken in view of the family history, um, and this K was negative. Um, now, we'll come back to this case later to discuss the management approach, but at this stage, we'd like to ask our audience, um, in addition to the conventional radiotherapy, what would your decision-making be on systemic therapy for this premenopausal patient? Um, she's got good features from the biology point of view, but she's got a node involved. Does that immediately mean she needs chemotherapy? And if so, what? Um, would you give endocrine therapy? What endocrine therapy options would you give? Um, and would you consider any additional uh, adjuvant therapies beyond that? So if we look at the results of the Oncotype test that was ordered in this patient, it came back with a recurrent score of 20. Now that equates overall in the uh, trial to a, uh, the, the, the data that derived these results, um, a 6% um, risk of recurrence at nine years, and overall no absolute benefit from chemotherapy. Now this is related to the Taylor X trial. I've just used this ex as an example. I know this patient has one node and we'll look at that. But it's just to pull out the issue here that in postmenopausal patients, we quite clearly see on the new reports now, no benefit for chemotherapy here. But we see in the patients under 50 that you start to see a creeping in of benefit of chemotherapy. That is around about the 1% mark if you have a recurrent score between 6 and 20. But as soon as you cross the 21, it goes to 6%, maybe 15% when you get above 26. And that suggests that there is this gray area of benefit in premenopausal patients. And I'll just show a few data slides to illustrate the thinking here. Now, if we think about the Taylor X trial, which remember is node negative patients, um, the first publication came out in 2018, showing in the low and intermediate groups, no benefit from chemotherapy overall. And that was very important from a practice changing point of view, uh, particularly in postmenopausal patients. But subsequently, papers have shown that you have to also think about the clinical features. And this second publication from Sperano showed the clinical low-risk features, and I've highlighted here our patient with a small tumour that was grade 2. Because if you actually look in the premenopausal patients at the degree of chemotherapy benefit, if you look at the addition of those patients less than 50 as to whether they've got low clinical risk features, then they actually had no benefit from chemotherapy in this particular group. And it was only the high-risk clinical features based on grade and size where all of a sudden the chemotherapy benefit in the under 50s seemed to come. Now, if we look at Rx Ponder, which was published and then updated at San Antonio Just Gone, we've got this clear difference between pre- and postmenopausal patients, where again, with the recurrent score of 0 to 25, no benefit in postmenopausal, but a magnitude of benefit that is quite significant in the premenopausal patients. At the current time, we don't have a breakdown in our exponder like we do in Taylor X of the additional layer of clinical features to know really if there are a subgroup that actually doesn't get much in the way of chemo benefit. But if you look at Taylor X, it does suggest that if you've got small node negative um, grade two tumors, you may not get the degree of chemotherapy benefit. As far as adjuvant therapy AIs, I just mentioned here that you might, in premenopausal patients, think that they all should have LHRH agonists plus an aromatase inhibitor. But the updated data we saw at San Antonio, with 12 years of median follow-up now, show that overall there was just a 1% uh, difference in uh, survival at 12 years between LHRH aromatase inhibitor and LHRH tamoxifen. And you can identify subgroups in where the absolute difference between the two approaches is really very marginal. So I just want to point out before we have a discussion about this case that this patient also potentially could have been a candidate for the Monarch E study, but only in cohort two, which Erica described. And this was a cohort where they had one to three nodes and an elevated key 67, but they didn't have the other clinical risk features. In other words, they weren't a grade three and it wasn't a large tumor. So this is exactly our patient here, a, two cent a one centimeter grade two tumor with one node involved, but had a key 67 of over 25%. Now that cohort in the trial is only 500 of the five and a half thousand patients, only 10%. And the data on that individual cohort are immature. 
So in the absence of clinical risk features that would put you into cohort one, we still don't know whether key 67 alone is enough to be a risk factor to derive that benefit until we got the mature data on cohort two. So returning to this case, um, I think the issue for discussion, uh, Erica, and I'd be interested in your thoughts here, is would this patient for you be offered chemotherapy? A 39-year-old patient with one node but other good features and that Oncotype score of 20. Where would you come in and you're thinking about this patient for chemo and, 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 and your endocrine options? Yeah, I think this is a great question and this is uh, about as tough as they come in terms of cases. You know, I, I think in some ways for me, the decision about endocrine therapy and chemo is actually a little bit tougher um, than the decision around abemocyclob, and, and I'm sure we'll get to that. But, you know, the responder data right now for people like this shows that chemotherapy has a benefit. Now, what we don't know is how much of that benefit can we account for by doing something like ovarian suppression and aromatase inhibitor? And we know from our soft and text trials that it's the people that have positive lymph nodes that derive a survival benefit from that ovarian suppression and kind of optimization of endocrine therapy. So, you know, she's the one positive node, you know, she's on the lower end of that spectrum. Right now, our data would suggest to at least discuss um, chemotherapy with her, um, being less than 40, et cetera, um, having, you know, the score of 20 and having that positive lymph node. But I think we really need more trials kind of asking what's the absolute magnitude of benefit of chemotherapy over just ovarian suppression and aromatase inhibitor. Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, this lady came to me for a, for a second opinion because of a split decision in her own local hospital as to what to do here, just reflecting the, the uncertainty. And um, the patient herself was not particularly keen on chemotherapy. Uh, and the discussion I often have is that if the chemotherapy question is very borderline, and I'm, I'm just, I was, I'm trying to translate that further analysis of Taylor X into our exponder, and I'm not sure what we, we, our exponder hasn't done that yet in terms of applying these clinical features on top of the oncotype. Because I don't think we should be driven just by an oncotype number. We have to look at the patient as a whole and look at the biology as a whole, look at the stage as a whole. But it starts to become different as soon as you stray into node positive disease. I agree. And you know, the other thing is, I don't think one positive node is biologically the same as three, right? And they're all grouped yeah. together. So I think there's shades of gray within there as well. Correct. And I think the discussion I have, if, if, if we're not doing chemo, then I say, look, the optimal therapy is to ensure you have ovarian suppression. Um, and then whether it's tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitor, I, I say, look, there's, there's marginal differences because it's driven by tolerability. But I believe that if the biology is as favorable as this, um, and the patient is very ambivalent about chemo, and particularly if they're in their sort of mid-40s, it's a little bit more challenging in the late 30s, um, that I'm thinking much more about ovarian suppression and whether that transitions into permanent or not is another matter. Um, and that might derive just as much benefit. But as you know, there's no trials that compare chemo versus ovarian suppression. There's just an indication that a lot of the chemo benefit in Taylor X in certain uh, instances and to some extent in our exponder comes from inducing ovarian suppression. Um, would you give her an aromatase inhibitor if you gave ovarian suppression or would you give her tamoxifen? If I give ovarian suppression, I typically do start with an aromatase inhibitor. We can always peel back to tamoxifen if we have tolerability issues, but if I'm optimizing endocrine therapy, I'll, I'll put AI with that. Yeah. Um, and in terms of adjuvant um, although this was a patient, as I said, could have gone into monarchy in, in cohort two alone, um, do you think that this is an abemocyclib case? Yes or no? I would say no. Um, I'm, I'm going to side with the FDA here and be a bit of a purist. Um, you know, certainly she did have the key 67 of 25 percent, but she had a very small tumor, 1.1 centimeters. She also had grade two. Um, so, you know, currently that's not, uh, you know, who would fall into the approval. Um, certainly those patients were allowed onto trial, but as you eloquently, you know, showed us, you know, that was really a minority of patients. The benefit here is single digits. And so if you have somebody that, you know, is really on that smaller risk um, end, I don't know that I can confidently tell that patient that I'm sure they're going to have a benefit. And there are for sure side effects. Yeah. 
So I, I agree. I don't think this patient falls into the, the indication for a bemocyclib uh, at all. And I wouldn't, I didn't discuss it um, at all with them. So I think we need to wait and see what that data actually shows as to whether with low clinical risk features, but just a high QCM. The other thing is that somebody's 25% might be somebody else's 18% might be somebody else's, you know, I think the other point about showing the key 67 if this was a key 67 of 60%, it would be a different ballpark. But I think it's much more muddy waters when it's around about that 20% cutoff or just above or just below. I agree. I think if her key 67 was that high, we'd probably see a different oncotype as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but you do get discrepancies between the the grading, the oncotype and the key 67. So it's just to, you know, in, in, in clinicians practice, be aware that it's never one thing in particular, it's a combination. Um, we'll move on to the other case, but but um, Erica, she, she would add, uh, ask, ask you, could she have another child? Yeah, we're full of the tough questions today, right? So, I mean, the first this thing- This is a that, real case, this is a real case, actually, <laughs> know. you know? The thing I'm cognizant of is the fact that she's 39. Right, so she's already a little bit on, um, you know, the older end with some declining fertility. Um, for people that do want to have children, you know, obviously we recommend them being off endocrine ther therapy for a period of time before they try. I'd be very worried that if she did start endocrine therapy, took for a year, two years, three years, or whatever, that then when she stopped, she'd have trouble getting pregnant. So if this was a patient that really wanted to get pregnant, I would probably recommend egg banking or embryo banking at this point uh, to try to help her be more successful later. Yeah, and that's kind of the discussion we had. And I think it's a very different matter in somebody in their early 30s who haven't had any children and so on. And it's about the level of risk. And you want patients to at least have a few years of their adjuvant endocrine therapy to, to stop those early recurrences. But these are, these are the sorts of challenging issues we have. Um, for the sake of time, I think we'll move on to uh, the other one of the other cases. So, uh, Eric, I'm going to pass over to you to uh, raise the issue of extended adjuvant endocrine therapy. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to discuss this. So this is case three uh, to set the stage. This is a 59-year-old postmenopausal uh, female who in 2014 had a left breast mass that was symptomatic and she noticed uh, it was two centimeters with microcalcifications. Um, on ultrasound, the axilla uh, did look normal. Uh, biopsy was strongly ER positive and HER2 um, positive invasive ductal carcinoma. It was two plus, I believe. Um, she had a mastectomy that was, uh, showed a 1.8 centimeter uh, grade two invasive ductal carcinoma with no involved nodes, no lymphovascular inv invasion, and then the fish um, did come back negative. So this is a HER2 uh, negative tumor. Her oncotype showed a recurrent score of 19 uh, and did not suggest benefit of chemotherapy and uh, she pursued endocrine therapy with an aromatase inhibitor um, for five years. And so here we are in May of 2019 for the purposes of this case, and there are some questions. Uh, do we stop or continue the aromatase inhibitor? What's her ongoing risk of recurrence? What's the benefit for further endocrine therapy in terms of absolute benefit? And what's the harms? And so we're going to come back later to this case to discuss, but we'd like to ask the audience, would you stop or continue aromatase inhibitor for this patient if she's tolerating at this point in her disease course? And so this is data uh, that's a little bit older from the New England Journal, really showing for ER early breast cancer the long-term risk of recurrence. And we know that this is unlike triple negative or HER2 disease, where if someone's going to recur, we expect to see that in the first several years. After five years of endocrine therapy, recurrences continue to steadily increase, really, for up to 20 years. And we have this situation where we think that the endocrine therapy benefits, and then we probably get about five years benefit after the endocrine therapy. So you take five years of endocrine therapy, you kind of get 10 years benefit. If you take 10, you kind of get 15 years benefit. And so I think um, even for T1 in zero disease, you can see here at the very bottom curve, you see at year 10, 15, 20, that there are still increasing recurrences here. And so this is an overview of extended adjuvant endocrine therapy, um, including AI. You can see a variety of studies listed here on the left. And we've got negative studies and we've got positive studies. And it's really quite a mixed bag where it's hard to give a patient a definitive answer of whether there's benefit 
um, universally for extended endocrine therapy. And so we'll come back to this case and maybe Stephen, I'll pose these questions to you. She's tolerating her aromatase inhibitor well. She was a no negative patient. She had 1.8 centimeters of cancer and had a low oncotype. Is there a reason you would continue endocrine therapy past five years for this patient? I think it's a discussion we all have with our patients and these are just as challenging questions as the initial decisions about which are our treatment options. Because if patients are tolerating treatment well, and they are free of cancer, uh, they really don't want to stop because they feel that that's what's keeping them free of cancer. And it's a, it's a tough argument to have. Um, I think the sweet spot seems to be around about the seven year mark now from what all of those data in, in Michael Gannant's nice uh, slideshow that we looked at. And I think the ABCSG 16 is really helpful in saying, look, you know, 10 versus seven um, is really not that different at all with a hazard ratio of one. Um, and the issue is often then, how is the bone health? Is it deteriorating gradually? And what's her individual level of risk? Um, and equally, a lot of the time, it's about reducing contralateral cancers. And this patient didn't have, but many patients, if they'd had a contralateral mastectomy, then their benefit beyond the five years becomes extremely marginal. Um, so it's that benefit risk discussion that we all have. Um, if her bones were strong and she was adamant she wanted to carry on, I think that, that that's perfectly appropriate. But we don't really know long-term other cognitive effects or anything else really, you know, although all the data seem to be relatively reassuring. So I would try and start to warn her that there's an optimal duration, but it may not be that at that five-year point she's ready. Some patients are, but normally if they're still on it by five years, they're tolerating it from the joint point of view. Um, and then I really start to look at the bone health. But you can never tell her that her risk has gone to zero because of that pan data about the ongoing risk in the, in the T1N noughts. Um, so it's, it's a challenging discussion. Absolutely. So I'm going to hand it back over to you to discuss topic four, assessing the optimal endocrine therapy selection and benefit of adjuvant CDK4-6 in our premenopausal patients. Thank you. Well, premenopausal patients occupy a lot of our practice. And in the trial, we certainly had, you know, 43% of the patients were premenopausal. As Erica said, the median age was 50 and it was a, an overall a younger uh, patient population that we had in the study. So here's a, 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 another of my patients. Um, so she presented in uh, July 20, just into the, the, the pandemic, uh, with a symptomatic mass in her right breast, um, two and a half centimeters on ultrasound, core biopsy confirmed it was a grade three cancer. Hormone positive, HER2 negative, axilla looked radiologically normal, and the MRI suggested that this was unifocal disease, and her PET CT staging was negative. So she was suitable for breast conservation and she had uh, an excision and a central node biopsy. She had a 2.6 centimeter grade three invasive ductal carcinoma with one out of four micrometastases. Now, while there was just one micrometastasis, there was on the report multiple foci of lymphovascular invasion. The biology of the tumor was strongly hormone receptor positive, eight out of eight on the ORID score for both estrogen and progesterone receptor and negative for the HER2. Um, an oncotype was uh, ordered because of the borderline nodal status uh, and it came back at 24. So a 19% risk of recurrence at nine years with endocrine therapy alone. Um, so she was given chemotherapy. Uh, she had four cycles of accelerated EC and 12 weeks of weekly paclitaxel, fairly standard anthracycline taxane based regimen that is used in, in uh, pretty much globally in these sort of situations. She had uh, conventional radiotherapy, uh, as you can see here, with a tumor bed boost, and she was started on tamoxifen with a view to switching to an aromatase inhibitor once postmenopausal, given that she was 45 years of age. So before the dis we discuss the case in, in any more detail, we'd like to ask our audience, what do you think would be the optimal initial endocrine therapy strategy for this patient? Um, and another question really is to also consider whether you think she's a candidate for uh, a bemocyclib. And then uh, we'll come back to those discussions subsequently. So Erica, I think, how would you approach this patient? Um, one of the first questions I'd like to discuss because it's always a debate is, is this truly node positive disease? Is a micromet node positive? Yeah, 
I, I think that that's tough. You know, um, certainly, you know, she has a micromet. You know, it, it, I don't feel the same about it as I would, you know, for macromet and two nodes, et cetera. Uh, I think this uh, case is a little bit murkier um, just because of all the lymphovascular invasion she had, et cetera. Yep. She had a higher tumor. She had a grade three tumor. We don't know her key 67, but there's several things pointing uh, here to me that she's got more aggressive biology. Exactly. And that's really why I, I put the case up because it's not just node positive, yes or no. Um, and often, you know, when you do your oncotype forms, that's what you have to put in. And you have to put in, is it micromet or is it macromet? Um, but LVI is a very, very strong surrogate for nodal involvement. And, uh, you know, she, uh, if you see extensive lymphovascular invasion in a node negative patient or a micromet patient, I think you treat that patient as, as, as increased high risk and, and uh, almost deal with them as if they're node positive disease. So I know we're taught to say micromet is truly node negative, but there's micromet that may not be node negative um, in exactly this sort of case. So I kind of, in my thinking, felt that this was really a node positive patient. Um, so if she has chemotherapy and she was premenopausal before and she's under 50, um, what's your initial endocrine treatment of choice here? Yeah, I mean, I think what you did is quite reasonable. You know, these patients that are in their older 40s where you know you can utilize a switch strategy, that they're going to become truly postmenopausal, et cetera, especially, you know, with that questionable node. And, you know, you're probably going to aim for at least maybe seven years in her. And so several years of tamoxifen followed by aromatase inhibitor, I think, is very reasonable, um, especially around the time that she had chemotherapy and is probably, you know, having some hormone um, decrease already at that point. Yeah, and I think that the sort of practice point here is is not to be um, uh, tempted to just put this patient straight onto an aromatase inhibitor. Um, the likelihood is that her, her periods would stop and she'd start to develop symptoms of hot flushes and so on. Um, and she would be pushed into the menopause because of the chemotherapy. But um, there's, there are several published studies now that if you just put these patients straight onto an aromatase inhibitor on its own, thinking that they're postmenopausal, you can reinduce ovarian stimulation and function because of the drive to the LH and the FSH, which are not fully, uh, you know, the ovarian axis is not fully switched off. And remember, for, for letrozole and, uh, is used as a fertility drug to induce uh, ovarian drive. So w there are well-documented cases where in women under 50 who have a switch off ovarian function due to chemo, the aromatase number alone will switch on ovarian function. And indeed, um, we've had patients known that then become pregnant all of a sudden. They think they, they can't get pregnant, the, the periods have stopped and they can, uh, and they're, they're, they're protected, but they're not. And then they suddenly discover that they're five months pregnant. So it is a really important practice point to make sure that these patients go on to tamoxifen first and that you monitor the, um, uh, that they are amenorrheic, and in due course with serial bloods or whatever, um, when you tr you can transition to an aromatase inhibitor later. But as but as Erica says, the it's the long game here is is prolonged therapy. So I always say to my ladies, look, you know, tamoxifen up to, you know, four or five years, and then switch you to an AI in the second five years, um, is important. Um, do you find some people wanting to put patients on an ovarian suppression after chemo here, or would you? Would you write it out and see whether chemo has done the job? Yeah, I, I wouldn't do that for this patient, but I certainly do in some circumstances. You know, if we'd had that 39-year-old patient with the lymph node positive, yeah. et cetera, yeah. you know, there's a survival benefit for that patient getting aromatase inhibitor. And I don't feel confident that her ovaries are shut off. And so I would do ovarian suppression in that case. Yeah, exactly. And I think if you do ovarian suppression in this case, you A, you may not need it. And B, if you do use it, you never know whether when to stop it. Um, and then, then you're going down the discussion of, of oophorectomies, which may actually never be needed in this case because chemo's done the job for you. But in the, in the under 40s, it's a very different um, discussion. So I would start with tamoxifen, um, uh, monitor, and, and may not even switch to an AI for some period of time. Um, and, and you said 10, seven years, uh, you know, maybe up to 10 um, certainly, she should be more than five years, shouldn't she? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, do you think she's a candidate for abemacyclib now? 
Well, the, the key piece of information we don't have here is the key 67 in her particular case. You know, she had a, a tumor that was 2.6 centimeters, doesn't meet there, does meet for grade three, but then she had a micromet. So again, she's at the little bit of the lower end of the spectrum that I'm not sure is gonna get significant benefit from Abema. So would you in your, I mean, this patient didn't have a key 67, it wasn't being, being done, but if she was in your practice now to help you in your decision making, I mean, you've got an oncotype that's in the mid 20s. Um, so it's not, a, it's not biologically a sort of, you know, recurrent score of eight or nine. Um, would you you would order a key sixty seven in this case to, with a view to seeing whether she would be I would. eligible? Yeah. yeah, I'm ordering a key sixty seven in any of the node positive patients that would be willing to do a memocyclib at this point, just to to see where they are. Yeah. And given that it was micromet, but there's lots of LVI, would you be thinking of her? Well, really, in clinical practice, this is no positive disease. If she's got key sixty seven that's elevated, I would consider a bema. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, um, and what, if she asked you, Erica, before I just look at some data slides, and, I, and hopefully um, our audience have been thinking, what is her residual level of risk? Because she will come to the clinic, she's well-educated, she understands that she's done everything she can to reduce risk, but she wants to know, um, you know, over 10 years, or let's say over five years, what's her risk of recurrence? Would you have a guesstimate as to what you thought that might be? Yeah, I mean, I think when we get into guessing those numbers, um, we're probably best going off of what we get on the oncotype a bit and then taking into some of the clinical parameters. So, I mean, I think you bring up a good point. You know, she, you know, is the vast uh, chance is that she is going to be cured, that she's not going to have recurrence. And so when we get into these really tricky situations of, you know, ovarian suppression or AI over tamoxifen, you know, we're really talking single digit benefits in a situation where the vast majority of people out of 100 are cured. So I think that's important when we get into tolerability and adherence, because if somebody's really miserable, I think it's you know perfectly fine to step back yeah. to go to tamoxifen, that type of thing, because probably the magnitude of what we're losing is not great. Yeah. So I think with that in mind, I just wanted just a couple of slides from the, from the trial just to remind people what levels of risk are. As you say, the advantage of Oncotype is it gives a number for the patient for their individual tumor, and we can frame our discussions around that. And it was around about the 19-20% uh, the mark. Um, these are data from the GAICAN group that look at patients who are treated with modern-day chemotherapy, anthracyclines, taxanes, aromatase inhibitors, um, so postmenopausal patients primarily. And if you have one to three nodes and you're grade three, or if you have more than four nodes, um, you can see here that on average, despite current standard of care, you've got a 30% chance of recurrence within the first five years, maybe up to 40% plus in 10 years. So just using clinical factors alone, you can identify. Now, I know this patient wasn't particularly node positive, and you know is around the gray areas, but you've got data from clinical trials. And we've seen the data in terms of the absolute benefit of a bemocyclib here uh, of around about 5.4% at the three year point. And I think I just point out the blue line here for these patients who are at increased risk is the endocrine therapy alone. And when we designed the trial, we projected it based on very much like the GICAM data, the NSABP data, that around about 20, 30% might have been relapsing by five years. And if you look at the endocrine therapy alone arm in blue, it's well on course for that with 17% already having relapsed at the three year point. So we know that that is going to be something that will continue um, to be a risk factor. And if you look at the patients, you can see here that the premenopausal patients, um, which were 43% of the trial, um, really have a very strong hazard ratio, less than 0.6 here in the updated analysis. So premenopausal patients are at increased risk here, um, and if they have the other features eligible for the trial, a bemocyclib does appear to be providing them uh, significant benefit. So I think we've got time for one more case, Erica, um, which I think you're going to cover, which really looks at the issue of toxicity management again and quality of life uh, and adherence to therapy, which you touched on in your very first case. Um, so I'll hand back over to you yeah. for our final case. Great.
So I, I think that this is such an important uh, topic. So this is a 43-year-old premenopausal woman. Um, she did present with a mass in her right breast. It was four centimeters on ultrasound and ended up being a grade two invasive lobular carcinoma that was ER positive, HER2 negative, and did have an involved lymph node. She had staging that was negative and then went on to surgery, had 5.2 centimeters of grade two invasive lobular carcinoma with 13 out of 15 involved lymph nodes. She had adjuvant chemotherapy, including both anthracycline and taxane, had radiation to the chest wall and uh, her nodal uh, regions. And then this is a patient that did go on ovarian suppression in combination with letrozole. Also had adjuvant zoledronic acid um, for three years. Then she ultimately also started on abemacyclib very shortly uh, thereafter. So uh, this case um, was seen for a second opinion. Uh, and Dr. Johnston, I'm sure, will tell us a little bit more about this. And it was really a quality of life issue. Um, she initially had some diarrhea for three to six weeks and then had some low-grade fatigue. Neutrophil count held up okay. She took um, some break off therapy, remained on the letrozole with the ovarian suppression, and her symptoms did improve off of bimacyclib. And so she had you know, a question of how important is this bimacyclib and do I really need to be taking this um, was still on 150 milligrams BID. So I'll pause here. We're gonna discuss this case, but we'd like to ask the audience, what would be your initial approach to the management and diarrhea and fatigue in this particular patient? So let's go back a little bit to the adverse events that we did see on Monarchy. And I think it's important to compare this to endocrine alone because uh, regardless of whether somebody takes a bimacyclib, we certainly are recommending endocrine therapy and that too is not without side effects. Uh, so diarrhea certainly more prominent uh, with a bimacyclib than endocrine therapy alone. You see almost universal diarrhea in 83% of patients. Luckily, grade three diarrhea was rare at about 7%, but as you know, even grade two diarrhea can really be quite challenging for our patients. Fatigue, also more common, about 40% of patients um, experiencing fatigue with endocrine therapy in combination with abemacyclib compared to really only about 16% with endocrine therapy alone. Again, very rare to be grade three um, at less than 3%. And then the count disturbances. Abemacyclib is our CDK4-6 inhibitor that we see less issues with grade three neutropenia, about half of what we see with palbocyclib and ribocyclib, but it certainly still happens. Uh, neutropenia grade three in about 20% of our patients. Then certainly we have things uh, such as hot flashes, et cetera. We do not see an increase in hot flashes of the bimacyclib. This predominantly is attributed to the endocrine therapy alone. And then also important to mention that we do see uh, a clotting risk. Um, so uh, any grade uh, clots with endocrine therapy alone is right under 1%, but it's about 2.5% uh, with the bimacyclib. So we may need to take that uh, into um, consideration for our patients that may have a genetic predisposition or a history of previous clot if they're not on anticoagulation. And then what about dose holds and reductions? I think that this is always a very important slide to try to make out, well, what was the functional impact of this from what we're seeing from an adverse event table? Did people have to dose reduce? Did they have to stop? You know, how, how does this functionally affect uh, the patient? And so about 66% of patients did have a dose hold. Uh, the majority of this was uh, due to adverse events with some diarrhea, neutropenia, et cetera. And then what about dose reductions? We saw dose reductions at about 40%. Um, and the majority of these um, individually were attributed to diarrhea. So what about discontinuations of abemacyclib? Um, we saw discontinuations of abemacyclib in about 27% of patients, where we did see about 15% of patients discontinue endocrine therapy alone. So about 10% higher there. And then we did not see deaths due to, um, due to this at all. So returning back to case five, we have this lady uh, that's clearly high risk. Uh, it was recommended that she take a bimacyclib. She uh, really had more issues with diarrhea and fatigue initially, um, but then kept having issues. 
um, ended up taking breaks, felt better on her breaks. And so now she's here saying, what should I do? Should I take a bimacyclib? Um, what should I do here? Dr. Johnston, what, what was your recommendation? Yeah, this again is a real case I saw just two weeks ago. And basically she um, had not admitted to a local oncologist that she'd stopped taking the drug, but she just did. She just couldn't manage it. And then she got worried about her level of risk and went back on it. Um, and really wanted to come and say, look, do I need it and how do I manage it? But I was waiting to see that the dose had been adjusted and it hadn't. And it's really important that if patients are struggling to know that you can deliver continuous CDK4-6 inhibition, but at a lower dose. These, do these drugs are developed often at flat doses. It's not like chemotherapy to, to height and weight. It's not dosed to, to anything other than the pharmacodynamic effect of the drug's in toxicity, and we, we, the other CDK inhibitors are dosed to the neutrophil count. This drug can be dosed to the GI side effects. And again, um, as, as Erica has shown, dose reductions in the trial were common, 43%, and yet discontinuations for diarrhea in the trial were less than 5%. And it's important to be able to stay on drug to derive benefit of the drug. We've seen with other uh, trials recently, if you get discontinuations of 40, 50%, then patients don't stay on and you have a negative trial. We have a positive trial here in patients at high risk, but they need to stay on the drug. So I immediately said to her, you'd go down to the 100 milligram BD dosing. And she didn't understand that that was an option, but so it felt so relieved because she appreciates that she has that high level of risk with 13 out of 15 nodes involved. Um, and we'll see how she manages on that. But basically in clinical practice, um, dose reductions usually work extremely well. And so being able to stay on drug and have the quality of life and the adverse events managed by the physician is really, really important. I think that's an excellent point. You know, I think that um, oftentimes patients, um, you know, if they're bringing something up, it's normally pretty significant to them. I ask kind of pointed questions about, you know, how is this side effect? Because people don't want to complain, right? And they want to take their medicine. Oh. And, you know, so I, I think really letting them know that you want to hear about the things that they're struggling with and there may be ways to help um, really kind of help open up that conversation. So I just wanted to highlight that there are supplemental practice aids here um, that are able to be downloaded. It talks about prophylaxis, detection, grading, management of these adverse events, as well as strategies to increase um, adherence that we've just been talking about. So key recommendations and takeaways that there certainly are clinical factors that can be used to identify patients with ER positive early breast cancer at increased risk of incurrence. This is nodal burden, this is gray, this is tumor size, this is prognostic assays. Adjuvant and bimacyclib has been shown to improve disease-free survival in our high-risk node positive patients and that key 67 is an important prognostic factor in ER positive disease, but not a predictive factor for abemacyclib therapy benefit. And that managing expected toxicities with abemacyclib is important to ensure patients can stay on therapies. Stephen, do you wanna give us the last closing words on this? No, I think that summarizes it very well. I think for, for, for people out there, this is an important new therapy. It provides real, clear, tangible benefit for these high-risk patients. I think understanding the data, who to select, and how to manage patients on therapy will ultimately result in the best success for the patients uh, and for the benefit of the therapy. So thank you very much, Erica, for the discussion, and I hope our audience have found that helpful. Uh, and please use the various aids that you can download, uh, and hopefully that's been a successful and help helpful program to you. This activity is certified by Medical Learning Institute, Incorporated. This activity is developed in collaboration with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.